Welcome to worship here at Bethany this fine Sunday. Today we are kind of still in between series. Last weekend was our, our Pentecost focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. And this weekend we are looking at the great mystery of God that we find in Scripture, that he is three persons and one God. We call this mystery the Trinity. So that will be the focus of our worship this morning. Uh, if you can take a moment to locate those green connection cards, uh, they should be on either end of the pew that you are sitting in. If you can fill one of those out, we'd appreciate it if you would do so and then put that into the offering plate as that comes by you later on in the service. Other than that, just go ahead and take a moment to greet those who are worshiping with you this weekend. We will then begin with our first hymn, Voices Raised to You We Offer. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and fail to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given us His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in mercy cleanse our hearts and lips that free from doubt and fear we may ever worship you, one true immortal God with your Son and the Holy Spirit, living and reigning now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 shows us the God who was present right at the very beginning. We see God the Father involved in his act of creating and preserving his creation, doing so, creating all things by the powerful word, which we know from the Gospel of John is indeed the Son of God, and then also the Holy Spirit is there blessing all with his presence. We read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. 
And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is God's word. I will invite the children forward now for the children's message. Hope you're all doing well today. Um, I got a quick question. I'll only take a couple of answers this morning because that Genesis 1 reading was so long and we have communion, so buckle in. It's going to be a long service and I'm preaching. (laughs) Quick question for you though. What are some of the ways that your parents show you that they love you? They give you stuff? Yeah, so they they give us things, they give us presents maybe, they give us food and things like that, right? Okay, they cook for us, yeah. Okay, so they say it, right? They actually speak those words to us, telling us that, yeah. They play with us. Okay, play with us. Okay, so they sometimes have to warn us away from danger. One more here. Okay, so they give us privileges as well, right? All of these are ways that they show us that they love us, right? God also shows us that he loves us. God the Father shows us that he loves us, first of all, by creating us, right? He didn't have to make us. He wasn't forced to create us. He wanted to create us. Why? Because already in his mind, even before we ever existed, he he knew us and he loved us. But then after we fell into sin and were separated from him, God continued to show his love for us. God the Son specifically shows his love for us as he saves us from our sin by taking all of that sin on himself and then dying on the cross to rescue us. And then God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also shows his love for us too by living with us, living in our hearts by faith and joining us together with one another and with God in that faith. 
so that we will live forever with him in heaven, so that we will know that love of our God, our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit forever. So let's fold our hands and we'll say a prayer. Lord God, thank you for loving us even though we are sinful people. Thank you for all of the gifts and blessings that you give us, especially for the gift of eternal life with you in heaven where we will know joy and know your love forever. Amen. All right, thanks for coming on up. You can head back to your seats. Our gospel lesson today from the book of Matthew, right at the very end of the book of Matthew, shows Jesus, after his resurrection, sending out his disciples to preach and proclaim the name of God to the nations. And that name of God is one that we find revealed to us in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Out of respect for our Savior's words and works, I invite you to please stand for the gospel from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age." This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite you now to confess your Christian faith with me using these words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn.
mystery first captivated my heart. I was probably five or six years old, and I uh, read a book called The Yellow House Mystery. It was the third in the famous Boxcar Children series. And after that, the other 34 that were available to me in the early 90s, I consumed in probably about as many weeks. From there, I moved on from the mixed-up files of Mrs. F Basil E. Frankweiler to the Weston game and ultimately into some more sophisticated mystery writers like Robert Louis Stevenson and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. But you know what I really love about 2023? Is you don't even have to open a book anymore. You just turn on the TV and you will find all kinds of different mysteries in all sorts of different settings. Whether you find yourself on the Lost Island or in one of the dozen CSI precincts scattered around the country, there is no shortage of good mysteries available to us on screens both large and small. That's because people just love a good mystery, don't they? They love it so much, in fact, that mystery has become a multi-billion dollar industry each year. We enjoy the puzzles and the problems that mysteries present to us. There's something that's intensely satisfying for many people about trying to piece together those clues and, and analyze characters and motives. The thrill that we get from seeing one of those leading characters in a life or death situation gives us an almost drug-like kick of adrenaline and something we can enjoy from the absolute safety of our own sofa or lawn chair. People love a good mystery. But can I ask, um, do you think you would enjoy it very much if the mystery novel or series that you were involved with ended and never really answered any of its big questions? If it just left you as puzzled and perplexed at the end as you were at the beginning? Maybe that's actually happened to you before. Perhaps you found yourself very invested in some television series and that latest season of it ended on the agonizing cliffhanger right before the big reveal and then in the middle of the summer the network decided to cancel it on you and you never got to find out who was behind it all or what happened to the main character or how justice was ultimately served in the end. That can be an intensely unsatisfying, maybe even rage-inducing experience for some of us. Yes, we love a good mystery, but we also want some answers, right? We need to be able to put our minds to rest. And when we don't have a tidy conclusion, we just kind of have that unfinished business running through our heads over and over again. Well, today, we are discussing a mystery, a mystery found in Scripture. We saw it way back there at the very beginning in Genesis 1. Jesus introduced us to that mystery yet again in our gospel reading from Matthew 28. And now, in our reading from 2 Corinthians 13, we see this great mystery of God once more. As we read, Finally, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the mystery, of course, that we are talking about today is that of the Trinity the triune God. Now that word Trinity is one that you will actually never find in Scripture. It's a Latin term actually which summarizes what the Bible teaches concerning God. Literally, it means three one. Not 31. That would even be simpler. Three and also one. One yet somehow still three. Now I'm going to put my cards on the table for you right away today here. Uh, if you showed up this morning hoping that I was going to explain the mystery of the Trinity to you in a way that you could finally grasp and comprehend so that you could leave here saying, oh, now I get it, you're going to be sorely disappointed. That is simply something that our finite minds cannot do. Doesn't mean, of course, that plenty of people haven't tried over the years. Some people have tried to use the picture of an egg 
to explain the Trinity, how an egg has a yolk, a white, and a shell, and yet it's not three eggs, it's just one egg. St. Patrick famously used a shamrock in trying to explain the Trinity to recent converts in Ireland, picking one of those leaves that has three parts to it, but is still just one leaf. Really, this doesn't work, though. All it does is reduce God into thirds. One-third Father, one-third Son, and one-third Holy Spirit. And that's not what we find in Scripture. And so, in more recent years, people have tried to use the various states of matter. You can find an H2O molecule, for example, as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But really, all this accomplishes is reducing God to a being who switches back and forth really quickly between roles as needed. And that's not the God that we find in Scripture either. Every human attempt to explain this mystery has fallen and will fall dreadfully short of adequately expressing what Scripture does concerning the Trinity. That he is three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and each one is distinct from the other. The Father is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. And yet all three are fully 100% God. Not just in the way that like three different gods might be pulling together as one, though, in the way that a, a football coach might use that terminology in reference to the 11 men on the field pulling together as one. That's not what we find either. No, there really, truly, actually is one, not three, one God. And while we can express that truth, as Scripture expresses it. We simply cannot wrap our minds around the logistics of how something can be three and one. It's a mystery, and it's frankly one that we can't answer and explain. But I want to tell you today that that that's okay. The first reason why that's okay is because it actually means that God is so much bigger and so much more complex than you and I are. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God says of himself, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Like, we shouldn't expect to understand everything about God and his ways any more than you expect your dog to understand why you do your taxes every spring. And I got to say, that's that's really a very, very good thing. Because if God could fit into the tiny little box of my brain and my experience, he really wouldn't be much of a great God at all, would he? The second reason why it's okay that that this mystery exists is because even though we may not understand the how of the Trinity, when this triune God does reveal himself to us in Scripture, he does so in a way that he provides us with answers to so many of life's other great mysteries. These things that have puzzled and perplexed humankind from the beginning, God brings us a solution to all of the most important, most perplexing ones. Now, there are so many we could talk about. There are so many worth discussing. But today, as we look at these verses, we are going to focus on three. Three of these mysteries that have puzzled humankind and even troubled humankind as well as God's three great answers to them. So let's jump right away here into mystery number one. How can I deal with my guilt? It's a question that has arisen in every human heart throughout history because the reality is that every single one of us does things that we know are wrong. Even if you like to think sometimes that you do an awful lot that is right, if we are giving an honest assessment of ourselves, there is also just as much backstabbing, cruelty, selfishness, and godlessness, if not more. 
And as we look at the people of the past, and as we look out at the people of the present, even at ourselves, we see that there are an awful lot of different ways that people have tried to handle that guilt on their own. Archaeologists have uncovered small cities worth of pyramids and temples in which animal or even human sacrifices occurred in the desperate attempts of some cultures to atone for their guilt before the gods. There are so many today who think that they are going to pay back that debt of their guilt, maybe even accrue some positive credit in God's eyes by their good works or their religious rituals. In an increasingly atheistic culture like the one we live in, there are plenty of people who try to deal with their guilt by telling themselves and others that they should just ignore it or at least find a way to justify the actions which lead to that guilt. And when that doesn't work, people will turn to substances or maybe even just to hours of mindless entertainment to drown out that voice of guilt that they hear inside of them. When we look at the people of the past and the present, though, one thing becomes abundantly clear, which is that we really have no idea how to deal with our guilt. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because we can't. We are powerless to go back and undo the wrongs and the hurts that we inflict on this world and its people any more than a murderer can go back and undo killing somebody, even if he is really, really sorry for it and tries really, really hard to turn his life around in the future. So then what's our answer? It's what we saw in the first part of verse 14. That answer is found in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if there is an even bigger mystery in the Bible than that of the Trinity, it's this, that the infinite, omnipotent God who holds the boundless universe in his hands confined himself to the flesh of a man and became one of us, hungry like us, tired like us, sad and frustrated like us, just not sinful or guilty like us. But then even though he had no guilt of his own to speak of, he became guilty. As he took all of your guilt, as he took all my sin willingly upon himself. And even more than that, as he took that punishment that we all deserved for that guilt and that sin onto his own shoulders, bearing it with him to a cross where he suffered and died for it. The perfect happiness and eternal joy then that Jesus did deserve and which you and I did not, that is what he now gives us in exchange for our guilt. And so we can consider this first mystery solved. Not because we can handle and deal with that guilt on our own in any sort of satisfactory way, but because Jesus has taken care of your guilt for you. And that means we can move on to mystery number two. What's the purpose of my life? It's the question that the graduating high school senior asks right alongside the 90-year-old homebound senior. It's the question that the young mother who isn't quite feeling the satisfaction she thought children would bring asks at the same time as the working woman who wonders what good her career ultimately serves. What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here How can I make a difference? Just as was the case with our first mystery, people have tried to answer that question in all kinds of different ways at all sorts of different times. Many philosophers would simply throw up their hands and say, well, the purpose of life must just be to enjoy as much happiness and pleasure as we can during our short time here. Others will maybe look to accomplishing, achieving something, a lasting legacy that they can leave so that even after they're gone, people will remember them, right? Building the big skyscraper in a major metropolitan area or maybe becoming a powerful politician. Lots of others today claim that the purpose of life is found in romantic love or in family or perhaps in the lifelong accumulation of knowledge. It's a list that could go on and on and on. 
And it's also a list that an ancient king of Israel named Solomon looked to in his pursuit of purpose and meaning. You see, Solomon reigned over Israel in what was probably their most prosperous period in history. There was peace and wealth and abundance throughout his land, and so he turned his mind and his heart toward this pursuit of answering that question. What's the purpose of life? And he looked for it in all the same sorts of places that people look for it today. Do you know what his assessment was, though, looking back on it all as an older man? In Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, he called it all meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And that Hebrew word that we translate as meaningless is literally like a fog or vapor. And like a morning mist under a hot sun, it ultimately all fades away to nothing. But with God the Father's presence in our lives, we both receive and distribute something which gives our lives true purpose each and every day. And it's love. The Greek term for this type of love is the word agape. It's the same sort that we find in the famous John 3.16 passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It is unconditional love. And just as the Father shows us this unconditional love, so much so that he even sent his one and only son for us, he now calls on us and gives us as our purpose to show this same love ourselves. First, to love him as he deserves to be loved and as he tells us he wants to be loved. To glorify him with our hearts and hands and voices, with our entire lives and being. To respect and adore and trust him as kids do for a dad who has given them everything. To honor and obey him because we know that this good father would never ask his children to do anything that was bad for them. But then also to love the people that the father has put into our lives. And to do so as he has done for us. Agape. With no strings attached. Loving them by doing what is best for them. Not because of what we have or might receive from them, but oftentimes in spite of the sin and the selfishness that we have received from their hands. That's the love that the Father shows you and me, and that is the love that he now gives us as our purpose in life. So our second mystery is also solved. My purpose is to love God and love others. And that means that we can see our final mystery. Where's my life going? If love is the goal, excuse me, if love is the purpose, what's the goal? Where will I end up? Maybe most commonly asked, what's going to happen to me when I die? Now, I know it might not seem like it at first glance, and I promise that I will explain this to you, but the answer to that question is actually found in what the Spirit brings. Fellowship. Sorry if it feels like I'm pelting you with biblical language stones today, uh, but that word fellowship in Greek is, is the word koinonia, and it means community, a shared or common experience with others. And that community, that fellowship is something that we in fact do have right now, and yet it also serves as a foretaste, a foretaste of community and fellowship that are still coming in mind-blowing measure. And maybe I can explain it with this illustration. Um, imagine that you are on a road trip to a wedding with four of your best friends. Already right there in the car, you are experiencing community, right? The jokes and the laughter, the conversations, both light and serious, the snacks, the soda, it is a shared experience that you are enjoying together. But it's also a foretaste. 
Because when you arrive at that wedding and get out of the car and join the celebration that's going on with all of your other high school or college friends or whoever it is, as well as people that you've never, ever even met before, then you begin to experience community, fellowship in far, far greater measure. And like I said before, yes, we already have this fellowship. The Holy Spirit has brought us into a community of faith and with it, the sharing of ministry, the sharing of sorrows and joys, the sharings of blessings and burdens. And that certainly is a community and a fellowship worth celebrating. But remember, you're on a road trip. Sojourners together through this life to the celebration that is coming, that is unlike anything you can imagine. And in the community of all believers of all time, like just imagine getting to explore the renewed creation alongside Adam and Eve, breaking bread or maybe eating some manna with Moses, singing praises to God alongside King David, maybe using one of the Psalms that King David himself wrote. And all of this hand in hand with your loved ones who have died in the name of the Lord. But there's even more. There's something even greater, something that that trumps all of that. And it's one more reason why we don't need to be bothered by this mystery of the Trinity today. And that's because it won't remain a mystery forever. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, as he is comparing our knowledge and understanding now compared with our knowledge and understanding then, says this, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You see, we will not only experience community with people, but with God. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, yet no longer a mystery hidden from our eyes, but one that we will see and that we will know face to face. Final mystery, also solved. Where's my life going? My life, in fact, already belongs in eternal community with the triune God. And so what's left now other than to do exactly what Paul told us to do in verse 11? Brothers and sisters, rejoice. And as you rejoice to continue encouraging one another in this grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and serving one another in that agape love of God our Father, As we share this journey together, in the name of our Holy Spirit, amen. We will now join our hearts and our voices together singing the Create in Me. gather our offering. Once again, if you would please put those green connection cards filled out into that offering plate as that comes around, we would appreciate that.
In our prayers today, um, we will remember, uh, first of all, the, the ministry of our share team here at Bethany Lutheran Church, um, as well as our Lutheran churches in Malawi, um, who are still recovering from Cyclone Freddy that hit back, I think it was back in March, um, a lot of rebuilding and uh, hardship that's still going on there. Uh, we will also uh, ask God... Uh, to be with Kyle and Jenna Peters, as well as their uh, little boys, Wesley and Ransom, uh, who were delivered quite early. Um, so we will ask that God, we will thank God for the blessing and then also ask him to continue to, to be with them, shielding them with his protecting hand. Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we praise and glorify you today simply for being the God that you are. Although we do not understand all your great mysteries, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word and through the incarnation of Jesus in whom all the fullness of the infinite God dwells. Thank you, Father, for creating us to be your children and for preserving us with your agape love throughout our lives, sinful though we are. Thank you, dear Son, for becoming a man so that you could live a perfect life and die an innocent death to rescue us from eternal death and hell. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for entering into our hearts through faith so that we now have spiritual community and belonging with one another and with you, our God, forever in the glories of heaven. We pray, most holy God, that you would continue to help us know you better by seeking you in your word, so that more and more we may witness your greatness and proclaim your one and only saving name before our world. To that end, we also ask your blessing upon Bethany's share team as we seek to restructure and revitalize that arm of our ministry. Lead us in wisdom and in love so that we might find innovative ways to connect with the lost and bring them the good news of a Savior from sin, death, and Satan. Please also assist that share team in equipping all of Bethany's members to do evangelism of their own so that they might become more confident and emboldened in sharing your holy name with their families, friends, and neighbors. Dear God, we thank you for the blessing of the two little boys, Wesley and Ransom, which you have brought into Jenna and Kyle's life. Please protect and watch over them now. Surround them all with doctors and nurses and technicians who will care for them as they would take care of their own families. We ask that you shield mother and children from any difficult complications of this premature delivery, that you would make them all healthy and strong, and that you would reunite them as a family and bring them home soon. Lord of all, we ask that you would be with our brothers and sisters in Malawi during their time of distress, one that's been ongoing for a couple months. Use generous people and organizations to send relief and assistance their way so that the hungry would have food and the sick medicine. Please open the doors which would provide a way for our brothers and sisters in Christ there to rebuild quickly so that they might soon have places of worship again where they can carry on an effective ministry. Provide for the pastors in need and encourage their hearts too, so that even through this disaster, your name might receive greater trust and glory by the work of their hands and the gospel in their mouths. We ask these things in your name, knowing that you, our triune God, will always hear and answer according to your good and gracious will. And we also now join in the prayer Jesus, the eternal Son, taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we confess that you, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, are one God and one Lord. And we acknowledge you as our creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We will conclude today with our closing hymn.